Today we're uh, starting a series, a four-part series on, on desperate and what that, what that means. And it's kind of a, a setup, really, uh, getting you ready for August. This uh, entire year, I've been really kind of working toward this next series on the, in August, I don't know exactly how we'll title it, but the idea is simply that of how do I recognize the voice of God? I don't know any Christian that doesn't struggle with knowing, is that me talking or is that God talking? And we all struggle with that. And next month, we're going to take a long look at the ways, the different ways that God speaks to us out of his word. And, but the, the preemptive strike, so to speak, of that is understanding the necessity of being desperate for God himself, because it's, it's paramount to the, the idea of walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't know if about you, but, but there have been many times in my life, and there'll be more times again where uh, I've been spiritually flatlined or, or just don't have the, the energy. I don't, I don't know if you, you're in one of those seasons now, but you know, if you're not in one of those seasons now, take really good notes because you'll be there again. You, you've surely been in places where, you, you know, if, if your life were a vehicle, the, the, the vehicle was fine, the engine was good, just no gas, no fuel. It just didn't have anything. And, and the problem is, is that, you know, we don't want to say anything about it because then you're afraid you'll get weird looks from your Christian friends, you know, they're, and then good Baptists are going to look for the sin in your life automatically. That's what they're going to do and try to find out, you know, maybe there's some place you're just off, off the rails. And sometimes that's true. There's no doubt. But, but in reality, there's times you just go into these dry seasons and you don't really understand why, but they're there. And the real issue is how do you get out of those? How do you, pull, how do you find your way back to the land of the living? I think the sad reality with most Christians is when you look at our prayer lives, most of it centers around what I would call crisis praying. Our prayer lives go up when crisis happens. When things aren't going the way we want them to, our prayer lives go up. And that's kind of a, a sad state of affairs because how different could life look for you? How different would your marriage be? How different would your job be if it didn't take a crisis to get you to spend time with God? How different would it be if, if you did that and learned to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit? And that's a way different way of, of living. I think life would look way different for us. But we all know there are times you just fall dry. So today we're going to start out talking about what to do when you're spiritually spent. What to do when you're spiritually spent. And like I said, if you're not there today, take notes because you will need them at some point. And we're going to look at that out of Psalm 107. Psalm 107. We're going to spend the next four weeks right here. So if you want to get a, a head start, pour yourself through this psalm. I, I, I don't know how many times I've read Psalm 107, but... There are different, there's basically four different situations in Psalm 107 where the, the people of God hit a wall. They hit something in their life causing them to be desperate. Now, we're going to read it and take a portion of it just today. Psalm 107. The Bible says, verse 1, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his loving kindness or his mercies are endure forever. His loving kindness is everlasting. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he's redeemed from the hand of the adversary and gathered from the lands from the east and the west and from the north and from the south. They wandered, talking about the people of God, they wandered in the wilderness in a desert region. They did not find a way to an inhabited city. They were hungry and they were thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. And then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And he delivered them out of their distresses. He led them also by a straight way to go to an inhabited city. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. For he has satisfied the thirsty soul and the hungry soul he has filled with what is good. Really, we don't have a lot of historical information on this psalm. You know, some, it kind of does sound a little like the Exodus maybe, or it sounds maybe a little bit like people coming out of the exile. But truthfully, we, there's just not a lot of, of history of exactly why they're in this predicament. And I actually think it's kind of fitting 
Because the truth is that many times in life, you don't know why you're in a dry season. Sometimes you do, but a lot of times you don't. But you just know you're there now. So the situation, as best we can tell, as simple as we can tell, is this. They were wandering without purpose. They were physically hungry and physically thirsty, and they were spiritually exhausted. You ever been there? Just spent. Had nothing more to give. Nothing more to say. Didn't understand what was coming next. And a lot of times we fixate on why. I don't know about you, but I do that. Hey, God, why, you know, why, why, why is this going on? I'm trying to find your purpose in this. It's a good question. I'm tr- but I need you to tell me, like, why is this going on? But, but we, we, don't, we don't really hear exactly why they're wandering here. We just know they are. So the real question comes down to, okay, now what? Now what? When you're in a spiritually dry season, now what? What do you do? What do you do to get through that? I believe there are several key pillars we can build that on today. And I'm going to share with you a few. And the first one is this. If you're in a spiritually dry season, position yourself around people that are filled with the Spirit. Position yourself around Spirit-filled people. That's a simple truth, but I'm going to tell you what. It works, and let me tell you why it works. I don't know if you've been in spiritually dry climates before, but if you've been through one or been through many, you'll discover they can be mentally crushing because you do exactly what the people did there in Psalm 107. You wander aimlessly, and you wonder if there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And if there is light at the end of the tunnel, is it a freight train or is it hope? Which one is it? The problem with spiritually dry seasons is they just seem to go on, and you just seem to be, as the old cliche says, you're just going through the motions. You're just going through the motions. I've been through there many times. But I want to point out something to you about dry seasons, and I don't want you to forget it. And it's simply this, that deserts were meant to cross, not to dwell. Deserts were meant to cross, not to dwell. And you need to remember that. Now, I know there are some exceptions. There's the Bedouin people out there. There's a few desert tribes across the history of time. But friends, listen to me. Look at most civilization across time, and you're going to discover where do most people, even in arid climates, where do they make their homes? By rivers and by oasis. That's where they settle. They build their establishments there. They stay near the water source. Deserts were meant to cross, not to dwell. And it's not common for you just to take up residence in a dry place. It's not. Jeremiah said, shall man fall and not rise? It's abnormal to stay there. I think it's very common to hit dry places for a host of reasons. But when you hit them, what do you do? You have to push through them. I love what Ecclesiastes 4 says. This is one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. Look at what it says. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they can keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Alone. When you are in a spiritually dry place, you have got to get around people that are hungry for God. Because you know why? Nothing cures hunger like hunger. Nothing cures hunger like hunger. You put yourself around people that are pursuing God. Let me tell you something. You're going to find yourself picking up energy. happens all the time. It's very common. You put yourself around people that are always poor-mouthing one another complaining about their situation, don't be shocked if you find yourself complaining about your situation. Don't be shocked if you find yourself down in the ditch in your mind. It's very common. You will absorb a lot of the attitude of the people you run with. It's very hard to keep warm alone. In fact, I think what often happens in dry seasons is we isolate ourselves. It's the single worst thing you can do. God has given you He's given you a people of God right here at Clearview. He's given you a people. He's given you opportunities to have a group Bible study, 
to, he's given you things right here in front of you. Don't run from the dry season. Press into the people of God. And I'm telling you, it works. You know, John F. Kennedy said, a rising tide floats every boat. And it's true, it works. Two are better than one. You have a fellowship. Use it. Now let's look at what Psalm says in verse 1. I would give you a second pillar to build your dry season on, and it's this. Testify about God's faithfulness in your past. Testify about God's faithfulness in your past. Look at verse 1 and 2. If you're not careful, you'll read right past this and you'll, and you'll miss it. We don't understand all the historicity between what's going on and why they're there. We just know what's happening in the moment and what they did to get out. Look at what it says in verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. You see, you can, read, you can just read that because it sounds common. For his loving kindness is everlasting. But now look at verse 2. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Listen, testify to God's faithfulness in your past, publicly and privately. Say so. Listen, it's one of the most, it's one of the most biblical things you can do. When you look across the Old Testament, you'll find the people of God doing this all the time. They'll shout out to God and they'll recall Oh, God, you made the heavens and the earth. Oh, God, you split the seas. Oh, God, you are faithful to Abraham. Be faithful to us. Oh, God, you did this in the lives of our forefathers. Do it again. Do you, you think they're reminding God of who he used to be? No, they're not doing that at all. They're telling themselves, this is the God I serve. That's what they're doing. They're reminding themselves. It, listen, testifying is a conduit. It's a conduit to reminding yourself, no, this is what God has done before in my marriage, and he can do it again. This is what God has done before when I didn't have a job. He can do it again. This is what God has done before when we, our business was on the rocks. We cried out to God, and this is what happens. You see, it's a conduit. You have to testify, and I'm afraid that so often amongst the people of God, this is where we miss it. We don't do this well. We don't shout our victories well in the Lord. We might mention it a little bit, you know, praise God, prayed about that, God brought it through. Listen, God's deliverance is massive, even in the small things. And you have to testify. I want to show you, I want to show you a, a place where you see this in the New Testament. Now, keep your hand in Psalm 107. Go to Acts chapter 4 for a second. Something really neat happens here. Acts chapter 4, here's what we know. We know that Peter and John have been arrested. And there's a lot going on. They go before the chief priest and Pharisees and Sadducees and all the Sanhedrin. They're, they're being questioned. We'll pick it up in verse 18. So they, they were told not to preach anymore. Acts 4, 18. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them. That's Peter and John. They commanded them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and he said to them, now, whether it is right in the sight of God to heed you rather than to heed God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we've heard and seen. And when they threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them on account of the people. Because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. For the man who was more than 40 years old who, on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. Now, pay attention. When they, that's Peter and John, when they had been released, Peter and John went to their own companions. They went back to the fellowship. And they reported what the chief priests and elders had said. And when the people of God, verse 24, when all the people of God heard this, they lifted their voices to God in one accord. Now pay attention to how they prayed. O oh Lord, it is you who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, your servant, you said, why do the Gentiles rage and why do the people devise futile things? The kings of earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in this city 
There were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose had predestined to occur. And now, O Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants, that's us, may speak your word with confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they prayed... The place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak the word of God with boldness. Look at how they prayed. I guarantee you these people were not Williamson County people. All right? Because I can tell you how most time we would have prayed. Oh, God, help. You know, they're going to put us in jail. Help us. They're getting mean to my kids. You know, they're, what happens? If we can't go to school anymore, they come take our church. They didn't pray anything like that. They prayed for boldness to do more. But in the midst of all that, they reminded themselves, oh, God, this is who you are. This is who you are. This is what you've done, and you're going to do it again. We've seen you do it time and time again, and we're going to see you do it again. Listen, it was not some Holy Spirit pep talk where you get all the positivity flowing you know, and talk to yourself and talk it up and pop it up and get yourself all ramped up. That's not what they're doing. It's not a Holy Spirit pep talk. It's reminding themselves of the God they serve. And you have got to use that when you hit a dry place. For it will focus you and get you through the dry time. There's one other I want to share with you this morning. When you're in a dry place... It's simply this. This is critical. You got to long for what was lost. You got to long for what was lost. Now, this is a little bit heavy because it's a reflection of ourselves. You're going to see it in, let's pick it up in verse 4. It says, They wandered in the wilderness in a desert region, they did not find a way to an inhabited city, they were hungry. And they were thirsty, and their soul fainted within them. And then they cried out in their trouble, and God delivered them. He led them by a straight way to an inhabited city. He, he, he leads them out of the, the distress, and it says to give thanks to the Lord in verse 8. And then look at verse 9. The entire psalm, I believe, this entire psalm hinges around verse 9, all of it. For he has satisfied who? The thirsty soul. He has filled who? The hungry soul he's filled with what is good. If you look throughout the Old Testament, you're going to see a key. And that key theme is simply this, that when the people of God have drifted from God, when they cry out, it's a key phrase, when they cry out, they return to God. You have to cry out. It's in the hunger. It's in the thirst because nothing cures hunger like hunger. Who was Israel? They were idol chasers. They were idol chasers. People that when life got going pretty good, they backed off a little bit, began to chase other things. God would call them back. They would repent. They would come back. And then they would go through years in a cycle, and they would do it again. They were chasers of idols. They'd go on their wandering paths. They would hit these dry times, and God would call them back. But you see here in verse 9 that nothing changed. Nothing changed in their situation until they cried out. I want to show you a momentum shift. You can see it if you look hard enough in this verse. Look at what happens. You see they wandered, and then he delivered. They wandered with no city. No inhabitants. They were hungry. They were thirsty. They were spiritually exhausted. And when they cried out, it says he delivered them. They went from a a crooked path. He led them straight. They went from no sustainability to a stable city. He satisfies their thirst, and he fills their hunger. All of that happened after they cried out. After. You see, when you become hungry... 
Desperation will drive you to that. And when you become desperate for God, he will begin to fill you. Friends, listen, this was not some Band-Aid solution. This wasn't some quick fix that God just threw their way. They came to God and they cried out because they didn't have it. You see, you only ask in prayer for what you do not have. You only ask for what you don't have. And if you want to see what's going on in somebody's heart, listen to how they pray. And they'll tell you where their heart's at. They were empty. But often what I found in my life, in the dry places, is that God uses the dryness to drive me home. He uses the absence of filling to make me long for it. Because nothing cures hunger like hunger. So when I am hungry for him, and I, he will take those, instead of complaining about the dry time, you may not know why you're in a dry season, you may not understand it all, it really doesn't matter. What matters is what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? Are you going to return back to the Lord? Are you going to cry out? Because nothing's going to change until you cry out to God. Crisis tends to create that if you let it. But you can't dwell there. Deserts were not meant to dwell. They were just meant to cross. So you push through it. Until you get to the place where you understand that you long for what was lost. When you look at the prophet Joel and you see all through what's happened, go read Joel sometime. And you will see that it was in the crying out when things returned. It was in the crying out when they began to be desperate for what they had lost for what the locust had eaten and what the worm had eaten and what the plow had torn down. When they realized what they had lost, then they returned back to the Lord. Nothing cures hunger like hunger. When you find yourself in a dry season, let it drive you home. Look at what Jesus said to this lady. John chapter 4. You don't have to turn there. I got it on the screen for you. Lady comes to the well to get a drink, and he says to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. Now, look, I mean, there's some things going on in her life, no doubt. But what he's basically saying is, Look, you, you, you're going to have to come tomorrow, and you're going to have to come the next day, and you're going to have to come the next day, and you're going to have to keep coming every day because it's, it's water. It's not bad water. It's going, to, it's going to get you through. You see, that's what we do in dry seasons. We try to fix it, and we row harder, and we work harder. Or when things aren't going well, you try to to fix it again and fix it again. And Jesus says, but whoever drinks the water that I give shall never thirst the eternal water. But the water that I give will, that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Nothing changes until you go after the real root issue. Desperation for God. How different would life look for you? If instead of being like the people in Psalm 107 who wandered by a straight, uh, a crooked way, who were hungry, what do you do when you're hungry? You try to find food, don't you? Try to fix it. What do you do when you're thirsty? You try to find something to cure that thirst. It's natural inclination, right? Or you could do the opposite of human nature. You could stop trying. And you can cry out. And say, God, you have to fill me. I'm empty. I don't have the energy. I don't have the want to. I don't have the desire. But you do. See, some some of you, even when it comes to clear view, I told the first service this morning, I I don't want to leave you exempt. Some of you are looking to people like me to fix Clearview or bring in some magical solution. Wow, are you going to be disappointed if you aren't already? You're going to be disappointed because that is not my role. The Holy Spirit builds our church. But what we do so often, even in church life, is we start looking for the right lever to pull or the right potion to mix up or the right ministry to change or the right hire to do over here. And in the end, it's just the same 
outcome every time. Or we could do something so very foreign to evangelicalism in today's world. We can get on our face and actually talk to the God that can change it. And actually talk to the God that can move the ball down the field. You know, I, I was talking to a friend of mine recently. Uh, I thought, I said, yeah, it'd be interesting to me. There's no way you could ever study this, but it would be fascinating to me if we could somehow get a spreadsheet of all the Christians in Middle Tennessee and Williamson County and, and just see where, where they all have gone to church in the last 20 years. And I got a sneaking suspicion just listening to friends of mine that we've pretty much all attended the same churches. Because when a dry time hits one, they'll make the exodus over to the next one. And then when the dry time hits another one, then they'll go south over here. Or when the dry time hits, you know, and, and, and we just keep rowing the boat, expecting somehow a different solution when the solution is before us all the time, it's Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. That It's very hard to want to fix ourselves. It's way a lot easier to blame a church. It's a lot easier to say, well, I don't like the worship over there. It's kind of dry. I think I'm going to change this one. Or maybe I... I I love the small group, but the, the preaching's not so much, and, and I, maybe I, I, but I do love the missions. You're, you're, you're just going to, I think probably we've all attended the same church. It just changes names. Until we can come to a place where we say here, there is no magic potion. You cry out. If you want to see God change things, you cry out. And that's why we created the 550 prayer gathering. But you know what I'm discovering? Probably a lot like you. It's way easier to try to install some great ministry aspect. It's way harder to get on your face before holy God and say, change me. Change me. Change me, God. Give me a vision for what you want from me here it's way harder to do that. But I'm here to tell you, friends, if you're desperate for God, nothing's going to change until you do that. Until you cry out, nothing's going to change. Who does he feel? The hungry soul. Who does he satisfy? The thirsty soul. Nothing cures hunger like hunger.